evening everyone uh, welcome to today's webinar on uh, renal calcula and surgical management it was a request of the viewers in the last uh, webinar that we conducted uh, two weeks back that we uh, we should have a webinar on uh, the topic on renal calculi so uh, i would like to introduce uh, today's speaker for the webinar uh, our dr kiran uske sir our uh, consultant urologist and andrologist at azara hospital uh, kiran sir has uh, uh, kiran sir has finished his mbbs from usmania medical college hyderabad and went on to complete his ms in general surgery from the same usmania medical college and after that he went on to do his fellowship in minimal access, access surgery and uh, diploma in minimal access surgery from international Labor laparoscopic center gurgaon delhi and uh, uh, he, he he got a seat in uh, mch urology and completed his mch urology from the same institute where he did his uh, mbbs and ms that is usmania medical college hyderabad and uh, <clears throat> to, uh, to put cherry on cake he was the gold medalist uh, uh, in his mch urology uh, and uh, he is one of the finest urologists that we have uh, in the city uh, now uh, on an average sir conducts around 100 surgeries per month urological procedures per month which uh, which is no mean feat uh, uh, and I'm very glad that uh, Kiran sir is here uh, for today's webinar. I welcome you, sir. Uh, Thank you, Nadi. Thank you, Nadi, sir. Uh, we, we will be having uh, the session initially, and then after the session, we'll be going with question answer session. Uh, I request all the participants to mute their uh, mics, mm -hmm. and uh, after the presentation, you can uh, you can ask any sort of questions that's related to this to, to today's topic. In the chat box that's available, and uh, I hope you have a you know, nice session now. So you can start, sir. Thank you very much. So, good evening, everyone. So, today we want to discuss about the uh, renal calculi and uh, surgical management. Discuss this topic uh, in, in terms of definition, etiology, pathophysiology, evaluation, and management. So, urolithiasis means the kidney stones, uh, means. Stones formed are located anywhere in the urinary tract, including the kidneys, or ureter, and the bladder. If the stones formed in the kidneys, they are called the nephrolithiasis. If the stones formed in ure ureter, they are called ureterolithiasis. If the stones formed in the urinary bladder, it is called cystolithiasis. So, before going into the uh, discussion, we endoscopic anatomy so that you can understand the surgery, surgical videos better. So, so, this is the endoscopic anatomy of the urethra and if you want to enter into the kidney we have to enter through the urethra through the ureter into the kidney so this is the urethra this is the distal penile urethra we are going through the cystoscope this is the proximal penile urethra then it is bulbar urethra So this this uh, this is called verum and anum. Above that, so this is the entire urethra, male urethra. You will enter. This is the bladder neck. Then you will enter into the bladder. So in the bladder, you will first in the right side. You will see the small opening that is right ureteric orifice. That is the right ureter enters into the bladder through this orifice, and the, the same ridge. From the right to left, that's the ridge is called Mercier's bar. This is the left ureter where the left ureter enters the bladder. That means you have the two kidneys and two ureters enters into the bladder, and we will urinate through the urethra. So this is the endoscopic anatomy of the urethra. So this is the endoscopic anatomy of the kidney. So you are entering into entering through the ureter by the with the flexible ureteroscope. This is the axial sheet actually, surrounding white one. Then you are entering into the ureter. This is the ureter. So, in the ureter, you will enter into the, this is the upper ureter. You are entering into the kidney. So, just see, kidney, kidney will have so many calluses. 
this is upper calyces that is, that means there, there are rooms in the kidney that is called upper calyces then these are the middle pole mid, mid pole calyces these two below then you have a, this is the lower pole so so if you consider the endoscopic anatomy you will enter into the kidney through the urethra then ureter then kidney and kidney also you will have calyces so modern of the stone disease around 2 to 3 percent of in the asia will develop the stone disease in their lifetime and uh, one in eight members will develop by the age of 70 so the recurrence rate of the stone is almost if one person develop the stone almost they will all they will again develop the uh, stone at 10 percent at one year and five percent at 35 years 35 percent at five years and after five years, almost 50% of the members will get again stones. So etiology and the causative factors for the uh, real stones include they may be acquired or they may be inherited. And the peak incidence will be around the middle age, they will get uh, peak incidence and the uh, male is to feel female ratio is 3 is to 1. And uh, hot or dry climates, there is a chance of more stone formation and the decreased wa water intake is also, uh, there is an increased chance of uh, stone formation and the diets rich in oxalates, uh, there is a chance of high uh, stone formation. Uh, what is the pathophysiology and how stones form? Most of the patients will ask this question only. This is the, the most key important factor is supersaturation of the urine. That means whatever the causes, whether it is a bacterial infection, whether it is anatomical abnormalities in the kidney or dehydration, they will cause supersaturation of the urine. That means urine is a uh, little bit concentrated so that the mineral content of the urine will be increased so that they will form crystals then they will form into the stones so there are uh, so many types of stones that is calcium stones oxalate stones phosphate stones and uh, stockholm stones that is a magnesium ammonium phosphate stone uric acid stones and cysteine stones the most common stones we will regularly see the calcium oxalate stones and the second most common is the uric acid stones so uh, evaluation of the stones. Once patient come with the stones, we have to evaluate by three methods. One is the clinical evaluation, then is the radiological evaluation, then metabolic evaluation. So the clinical evaluation means the patient, the most commonest symptom patient will present with the pain. The pain is actually, <coughs> the patient will describe it as the worst pain of his life. That means they will get severe colicky pain and sometimes they can get a constant dull pain. The radiation of the pain may be lying to the groin. Or in case of the males, that may be lying to the testis, and in case of the females, that is lying to the labia majora. So the most common symptom presenting is the pain, and then it is the, they can present with the hematuria. It may be gross hematuria or it may be microscopic hematuria, and then they also present with the pyuria, that is pus in the urine. So if you examine locally, in case of the acute renal colic, abdomen is usually tense and rigid. Uh, the tenderness present in the right line, but uh, if in a routine case, routine presentation. There are no abnormal findings actually, that is only uh, the complete only pain. So radiological evaluation, how you evaluate by radiological, there are mainly there is four uh, investigations, that is X-ray KB, ultrasound abdomen and intravenous urography and then non-contrast CT KB. So if you go for the initial imaging for all patients, it will be the, uh, previously it will be the X-ray and ultrasound, now it is replaced by the non-contrast CT. Uh, so X-ray, we detect only radio opaque stones. That means go which which are constant, which are which uh, radio lucent stones may not be detected by the X-ray, and it may miss small uric stones also. Uh, so the nowadays X-ray usually only to identify the radio opacity of the only we will we will do X-ray, but but the routine imaging we don't do the X-ray. Then ultrasound, the renal stones will be identified by the hydronephrosis and the posterior acoustic shadow. Uh, sometimes lower you to the bladder window, but the ultrasound cave is actually operator dependent. And uh, some some sometimes the lower ureter can be seen, and sometimes lower ureter cannot be seen. So the most important modality of choice and most important investigation in case of uh, renal stones uh, today is the non-contrast CT KEB. So today almost it replaces everything the ultrasound X, uh, X-ray. So it is the most rapid and most sensitive, specific, and it is accurate. And this, it is in the cost wise also, it is less expensive than the IVP. Previously, 
if if you are uh, if you are not confident enough in X-ray and uh, ultrasound, they are going for the IVP previously. But right now, uh, in CCT is enough. Uh, there is no need of IVP, oh, yeah, except in case if you want to assess the function, there is IVP needed. But to know the uh, to know the structure, to to know the stone position and size, now there is no need of IVU. So, but an, an additional advantage with the CT scan is it will diagnose other intra, intra other intrapatronal and retropatronal pathology also along with the kidney stones. So now it is the investigation of choice. It does not require the IV contrast, unlike the IVU. Then it is uh, intravenous urogram where you will you will admit admit some uh, dye into the contrast into the uh, venous system. Then you will do an X-ray. So that you will know the calcium anatomy and function of the kidney. It is usually done to know the first function of the kidney, and it is also to know the calcium anatomy so that we can plan for the procedures for the surgical procedures. <coughs> it should not be done in acute episodes. It is a very less less sensitive and specific than the CTKAB. It is also time consuming because contrast has to go through the kidneys and it has to come out, so it will take time. So right now we. <coughs> Before IV, IVU, NCCT is the investigation of choice, and uh, the most uh, another disadvantage with the IVU, most of us, one in forty thousand patients, uh, they will develop anaphylactic reaction. Okay. So X-ray, ultrasound, NCCT, and IVU. NCCT is the investigation of choice today for the genome stones. Another evaluation that is a uh, along with the clinical and radiological evaluation, we have to go for the metabolic evaluation so that we can know the cause of the stones. So metabolic evaluation includes lab parameters like the serum electrolytes, urea, creatinine, and all the uh, minerals of the urine. Then the urine examination, that is the pH of the urine and the uh, pus cells, range of the stone crystals and specific gravity of the urine. Then 24 hours urinary examination to know the total volume of the uh, urine and the creatinine and all the mineral contents. So that so the commonest metabolic abnormalities we will see in routine practice is the most common metabolic abnormality is the hypercalciuria that is excess of more calcium in the urine that is the most important factor in formation of the uh, crystals in the urine then they will form the stones hypercalciuria also three types uh, most common <coughs> most common type is the result that is hyperparathyroidism Another uh, common metabolic abnormality is hyperoxaluria, that is most uh, more oxalate in the urine, hyperuricosidia, increased uric acid in the urine, and hypocetaturia. That means citrate will protect the uh, protect the formation of the kidneys. So <coughs> decreased content of the citrate, hypocetaturia, uh, will lead to the stone formation, and hyperuricemia and hypercalcemia. That means increased levels of the uric acid, increased levels of the calcium in the blood will lead to the stone formation. After evaluation, uh, we will go for the management. So management, we will discuss in three headings. That is one is management of the acute renal pain. And there is a conservative management without any surgery. And then is a surgical management. Uh, in case of the acute renal colic, <coughs> most of the painkillers will help to relieve the pain. The most common painkillers used are the NSOIDs. They will block the synthesis of the prostaglandin so that they will decrease the stimulation of the pain receptor so that the pain will be decreased and other words the opioids they will have faster pain control than the enzoids and the other measures also that is drotavarin, buscopurin, <coughs> buscopurin antispasmolytics and the atypical opioids like clamidal whatever the painkillers they can be used to re relieve the acute renal colic it is the most commonly used are the enzoids conservative management of the urotel stone that means without any surgery <coughs> one is Stones less than 5 mm and uh, distance is less than 10 mm from the bladder. They can be spontaneous chance of passage. There is no need of any any drugs or no need of anything. Just simply taking water itself can passes the can uh, can pass the stone. Uh, then if, if it is little bit larger than that is if, if it is lower diuretic stones less than 8 mm. That means if the stone in the lower ureter and it is less than 8 mm, we can we can use some drugs to expulse. That is called medical expensive medical expulsive therapy. Uh, most commonly used uh, drug is the tamsulosin, that is the alpha blocker, which will relax the lower ureter so that stone can be passed. And then you can use the corticosteroids like the deflozocort, where the deflozocort will decrease the edema due to the edema caused due to the friction and it will increase in the expulsion of the 
uh, stone. So, tamsulosin plus diflozocart is the most commonly used combination to you to expel the stones, and the mo most of the under the common uh, ureteric orifice most common size is 5 mm. So, less than 5 mm, there will be spontaneous passage, and if it is less than 8 mm, also there is a chances of uh, passage with the medical expulsion therapy. But uh, always medical expulsion therapy or the spontaneous spontaneous passage uh, should be tried only when there is no obstruction with infection or when there is no increase in the deteriorating in the renal function. That is, if a <coughs> even less than five eight mm stones also, if there is an if there are significant uh, clinical features of infection and there is an uh, increase in renal parameters, we have to avoid the uh, conservative management and we have to go for the surgical management. So then the surgical management of the kidney stones so it will be the surgical management is different for uh, bladder calculus and different from the ureter and different from the renal calculus so the most common procedures uh, used for the bladder stones is CLT that is cystolithotripsy uh, then PCCLT that is percutaneous uh, cystolithotripsy and uh, another other method is open cystolithotripsy and we will later we will discuss all these in detail uh, then ureteric stones whether it is when, when it is a lower ureteric stone and mid ureteric stone, you can try for the URSL that is ureteroscopic stone lithotripsy. When it is upper ureter, stone is in the upper ureter, you have <coughs> two options one is URSL, and if it is under if it is through, through a rigid ureteroscope, if you can if you can if you can remove the stone that is URSL, if it is not possible, we can use the flexible ureteroscope um, to remove the stones that is called RIRS that is retrograde interregional surgery. If it is a renal stone, <coughs> there are three options. One is percutaneous nephrolithotomy, that is, you can you, can, you will remove from the back. Then retrograde entire renal surgery, you can go with the with the ureter only, we will go with the flexible scope and we will we'll fragment the stones. And ESWL, where you can't even touch the body of the uh, patient, uh, you, will, you will have some machine and we will we will generate, which will generate the shock waves and which will focus on the stone and the stones will fragment. So, there is a Nowadays, almost everything is the endo urology and open open procedures. That is when open urotolithotomy are that is the opening of the ureter uh, to remove the stones. Open pyelolithotomy that is opening of the kidney to remove the stones. It is uh, nowadays it is only it is a previous procedure uh, before the advent of the endo urology. Uh, this open procedures uh, right now it is only the incidence of the uh, open open procedures will be only less than one percent or two percent. Okay, so we'll discuss in detail about uh, every surgery. Uh, one is bladder stone. That is, most of the times, bladder stones will be formed due to the uh, retention of the urine. That is, any any of the obstruction to the flow of the urine. That is, in case of the males, it may be the prostate or <coughs> it may be the prostate or uh, stitcher urethra. In case of the females, meatal stenosis. Whenever there is an obstruction to the flow of the urine through the urethra, there will be a retention of the urine in the bladder, and they will form the stones. So it is very easy. Out of the, all the procedures, the bladder, removal of the bladder stone is little bit easy because you can directly go through the scope, cystoscope into the bladder, and we will fragment it with the uh, we will fragment it with the laser, uh, laser or uh, litho lithotripsy. Then we will remove the fragments. So usually the CLT, that means cystolithotripsy, that is the <coughs> by using the cystoscope, we are removing the stones from the bladder. It is usually done for the stones less than two centimeters. If it is more than two centimeters, it is little little bit difficult to remove the stones from the urethra. <coughs> then we will we will use percutaneous cystolithotripsy. That means we will we will we will insert one sheet just above the pubis directly into the bladder without using the urethra. We will directly go into the bladder with the scope. Or the second image will show that uh, directly we will go into the bladder and we will fragment through the scope and we will remove it. So we will, so by if it is by through the urethra it is called cystolithotripsy. If it is little bit larger than two centimeters, then we will go for PCCLT. If it is more than four centimeters and it is unable to, if you are, if you, if you are unable to remove even <coughs> even by the urethra or by the percutaneous approach, we will open open cystolithotomy. That means we will open the bladder and we will remove it and then we will suture the bladder. So this is the bladder stone, bladder stone uh, surgical management. Ureteric calculus, that is, uh, you can see in the image, uh, kidney and upper ureter, mid ureter and the lower ureter. <coughs> if the stones in the lower ureter are in the mid ureter, 
you can directly go through the uh, you can directly go, go through the ureter lower ureter into the up to the stone and you can fragment it and you can remove it it can be done with the rigid ureteroscope or it can be done with the flexible ureteroscope so just i will show you one video of a uh, urcell so this is urcell that means we are in the bladder right now we are in the bladder so oh, this is a, this small this is the ureteric artifice this is the left ureteric artifice which is entering into the bladder so we will insert one guide wire to enter our scope into the bladder to the ureter yeah you, we are inserting one guide wire so that our scope enters into the ureter freely so we will by using this guide wire we will enter into the ureter this is the we are in the ureter right now we are in the distal ureter that means lower part of the, this is the stone you can see this is the stone this is the stone and we will stones will have capacity when we are when we are fragmenting the stones stones have the capacity to go upward into the kidney then it is, it will be difficult for us to remove the kidney to remove the stone then we will use baskets stone baskets to stop the upper migration of the stones right now we are in, inserting the uh, i'll show you the insertion of the basket and move to the number I have open the image. This is the stone. We are inserting one basket. Yeah, we have the so we are holding the stone with the basket because when we are doing fragmentation the stone has the stone may go upward into the kidney then it will be difficult for us to remove through the ureteroscope so we are removing with the basket uh, whenever there is wherever there is a narrowing of the ureters we will break it we will fragment it so there is there is a narrowing of the ureter here so we will remove the this stone basket sheath So then we are fragmenting with the lithotripsy. Right now we are fragmenting the stone in the distal ureter. Right now we are fragmenting. So after fragmentation, we will remove. <coughs> so this is called ureteroscopic stone removal. That is URSL. This is usually done for the lower ureteric and mid ureteric stones. This is where inserting stent. So after removal of any stone from the ureter or kidney, we will insert the stent. Just because to heal, to heal better and to, to increase the drainage of the kidney post-operatively so that post-operative infection rates or any post-operative complications, complications will be low. So this is the schematic diagram showing the URSL through the rigid ureteroscope first diagram. The second one is the URSL through the flexible ureteroscope. The only disadvantage with the URSL is uh, it is usually used for the lower and mid ureter only and upper ureter <coughs> when you are fragmenting the stone it may go upward into the kidney so it is usually not possible <coughs> uh, to to use the uh, rigid ureteroscope in the kidney then comes the renal stones there are usually three surgical methods used for the removal of the kidney stones one is the pcnl that is we will discuss in later pcnl means we will directly puncture the kidney from the back side and we will remove the stones Another one is ESWL, that means patient will be 
patient will be on the ESWL machine, that is shock wave machine, which will generate the shock waves onto the focus of the stone. Then stone will be fragmented and it will automatically will pass out through the ureter. Another one is RIRS, that is by using the flexible ureteroscope, we will enter through the urethra, through the ureter, into the kidney and we will fragment using the laser. So RIRS is usually called as a laser surgery. So PCNL is usually used for the stone located in the kidney. So first, to enter into the kidney, we should have some contrast in the kidney so that we will insert. So now we are in the bladder. We are in the bladder. We are searching for the ureter carface. This one is the this one is the left ureter carface. Entering into the kid, entering into the bladder. So we will insert one ureter catheter. So we are inserting ureter catheter into the kidney so that we can we can inject contrast into the kidney so that we can identify the kidney system by the C arm. Then we will guide our puncture through into the kidneys to remove the stones. So this is a ureter catheter. So we are inserting into the kidney through the ureter. So it is usually done in a supine position. After insertion of the ureter catheter into the kidney in the supine position, patient will be shifted to the prone position. This is the position of the kidney to puncture the kidney and to remove the stones. That means patient is in the prone position and we will we will puncture the we will we will puncture by using the CR that is uh, by fluoroscopic guidance. We will puncture the kidney. Uh, then so it is still the ureter catheter. Then patient is. Uh, position prone and we will puncture, we puncture the kidney. Now we are entering with the nephroscope into the kidney. This is the antler sheath you are seeing, that is the puncture. Uh, the antler sheath is used to puncture the kidney. So we are directly puncture the kidney from the backside and we are entering with the nephroscope. So this is a stone. What you are seeing actually a stone. Out of all the procedures, that is the bladder stone, the CLT or the PCNL, RIRS, the more little bit difficult and little bit complicated procedure is PCNL only, because we will we have to enter the kidney only by two-dimensional way, that is CR, uh, only by that is uh, sometimes it is difficult to enter into the calyx. So now you are fragmenting the kidney, uh, so fragmenting the stones. Yes. It's a large stone, large kidney stone is around 35 mm. We, did, uh, we, we removed it in a single, single sitting only. So, this is all we are fragmenting the stones. Then after fragmentation of the stones, we will remove the stone fragments with the bar, with the grasper. This is the grasper. What is the grasper? Uh, we are removing the kidney pieces. We are removing the stone pieces. So we will remove the kidney stone by a small puncture on the back side. Usually the size of the puncture will be around 10 mm. That is the only one centimeter puncture. <coughs> so this is where we are all removing the stones. After removal of the stones, uh, we will insert stem and we will remove that stem after the 15 days. So this is the schematic diagram showing the position of the patient. Just I will let you know the, uh, all the steps of the PCNL. So this is the patient is in the prone position. The butyl puncture from the back side. This is under CM guidance. And this is actually we are doing. We are puncturing the needle through the kidney into the uh, pelvic system, this image. 
so after puncture of the kidney we will, will dilate the tract that means whatever the whatever the puncture done we will enlarge it with the dilators then we will insert nephroscope throw that uh, throw that puncture into the kidney and this is the look of the final look of the stone through the nephroscope so out of all the procedures uh, pcnl is the usually the most uh, complicated one because uh, we are directly puncturing the kidney and the kidney will receive almost more than 20% of the cardiac output so the most common complication after pcnl is the bleeding usually almost 90% of 90% of the patients the bleeding will be resolved by its own so there is no need to even retransfusion also around 5 to 10% you <coughs> will uh, you will have a uh, we will have blood transfusion and less than 1% that means if it, is, if it is uncontrollable bleeding through the any of the uh, any of the segmental arteries then we will go it for angioemulation so emulation of the renal artery so angioemulation is usually required in less than 1% of the uh, patients and sometimes if the bleeding is uncontrollable you may need a nephrectomy uh, in case of the pcnl then you, uh, while because you are puncturing the kidney <coughs> only under two uh, uh, two dimensional you may not know the adjacent organs so injury to the adjacent organs are the second most uh, threatening uh, in case while doing the pcnl the most common uh, in the injured organ will be the pleura because kidneys will be just below the pleura so even when some sometimes we may require the supra portal punctures and we will do the puncture through the pleura so pleura uh, pleura is the most commonly injured organ and uh, while doing the supra portal punctures you may do the pneumothorax and then in right side you can you can you can have injury to the liver also <clears throat> sometimes there will be retrorenal colon so colon injury may be there uh, so patient may get into the urosepsis yeah. so for all cases of the pcnl sterile culture should be the must because uh, uro, there is a chance of urosepsis because we will use the positive pressure uh, positive positive saline positive pressure within the, the system to 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 see the stones another method for the kidney stones the retrograde intraoperatory surgery rirs that is called the laser this is one of the most beautiful method even for the this is a, this is actually an alternative to the pcnl that is where you will enter into the kidney without any puncturing of the kidney you will just enter through the uh, she, uh, through the ureter with the, with the flexible ureteroscope then we will with the, with the use of the laser we will just fragment the stone so this is the video showing the rirs that is laser surgery where you are entering into the ureter you are entering into the ureter with the scope this is upper ureter this is the intrarenal that is already uh, stone is in the lower pole so we will go with the scope up to the stone so there is no need of any puncture of the kidney that is the most thing so then we will insert the laser fiber through the scope just you will see the laser fiber in the blue color so that is the laser fiber which is coming at 9 o'clock you will have you will have laser fiber with different types of scopes where you will you will have a laser fiber at 9 o'clock laser fiber at 11 o'clock laser fiber at 3 o'clock so this is the blue colored one is the laser fiber uh, at nine o'clock then we will directly yeah so we are directly lasing the stone yeah. yes this is this is laser fragmentation of the stone there is no bleeding no puncture no bleeding no damage we we'll simply go through the ureter into the kidney and we will we will laser it after laser fragmentation almost the stones will be the fragments will be around of size 1 mm 2 mm and they will automatically pass away through the ureter you can see the laser fragmentation
So So we'll make the large stone into small, small, small pieces. Around 1 mm and 2 mm of size. This is also called as pop farming. You can see the, the stone fragments are dancing like a popcorn. That's why this method is called popcorning. So even after the RIRS also, we will insert after we will insert the stone. So we will insert the st uh, stent and we will remove the stent after two weeks. So RIRS is actually an alternate with the PCNN, but the more disadvantage uh, part of the RIRS is, is less than 15 mm to 20 mm size stones only. We will remove it at first time. If it is a more than 30 mm, uh, more, more than two centimeters, most of the damage is difficult to lace. So it will take two sittings or three sittings. So by, but it's, uh, in case of PCNL, even larger stones can be removed directly. <clears throat> so if it is a larger stone, uh, if, if we, uh, we can go for PCNL, with the smaller stones, and if you avoid, uh, if, uh, if you want to avoid all the complications, then you can go for laser surgery. That is RIRS. So it is recovery is good, and uh, patient patient can be discharged even if. First post of day. That is after the surgery. Today surgery, the patient can go today evening or tomorrow morning. Okay. So another method method used for the uh, kidney stones, renal stones is the ESWL. Uh, today nowadays it is not routinely used just because it decreases stone clearance rates. In case of the ESWL, there will be one machine. Patient will be placed over the over the table where the machine can generate the shock waves. The shock waves will be directly focused at the stone, and stone will be fragmented. So we don't know whether the stone is fragmented or not uh, uh, perfectly. That's why stone clearance rate is usually low for this ESWL. Uh, today, nowadays, most of the times in uh, ESWL is not used. <coughs> and the indications usually it is done for the upper pole and mid pole stones. In case of the lower pole stones and the kidney lower pole stones, it is the, it, it is not used because after the fragmentation, stones has to be passed on its way. But lower pole stones. Usually have not the way to pass out, so ESW is not used for the lower pole stones. So the contraindication for the ESW will be <coughs> pregnancy because it is an X-ray, uh, it is a shock waves. So pregnancy, uncorrected coagulopathy, and uh, any 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 implantable cardiac device or any calcified aneurysms, it is an absolutely contraindication for ESW. The related to contraindications is uh, when there is an obstruction or infection. Uh, so it is a and uh, poor renal function decreases renal param uh, increases renal parameters and significant immaturity. It is a greater contraindications for the ESWL. So the complications of the ESWL will be hematuria. That is, after the shock waves damaging the kidney, <coughs> the first first image will show the uh, CT scan of the left kidney showing this black one is the subcapsular hematoma. After the ESWL patient developed the complication of bleeding, subcapsular hematoma. And then after the uh, second one is the stain, uh, that is stone street. That means you can see along the ureter, there will be a lot of small stones. So ESWL may not fragment the stone up to 1 mm, 2 mm. It will fragment the stone up to around 5, 6, 7 mm. So stone may pass, may not mark. Sometimes all the stones will be lined up in the kit, uh, ureter. It is called stone street. Okay. Then we have to go again with the second time with the surgery. Okay. So ESWL. <coughs> Nowadays, routinely not recommended. Uh, so one um, one more complication, like any other uh, stone surgery, uh, stone surgery is urosepsis, that is the infection. So finally, it is a diet advice and fluid advice for the uh, to prevent the uh, formation of the stones is uh, you, you have to take a good uh, good uh, good fluid intake that is around four to five liters per day, and you should have you should maintain around the urine output of two to two point five liters. And uh, avoid an extra salt and oxalate rich foods, that is uh, spinach, uh, potatoes, oxalate rich foods, and avoid the calcium rich products also. And high intake of the purine food, that is non veg chicken, mutton, uh, you will have a high purine diet. Uh, then, because high, uh, high protein diet will convert into the uric acid, then you will form a uric acid stones. <coughs> so, please avoid the intake of high protein diet and uh, increase the citrus, that means all lemon uh, so citrus items. Uh, Hypocitrate is one of the cause for the formation of the stones. So increase the citrus content. So you can you can have you can increase the citrus foods. 
So the conclusions, once detected, st uh, stone should be removed. Uh, otherwise, because it is always an abnormality in the kidney, stone is always an abnormality. Then if the patient with the renal colic, uh, first priority is the relief of the pain. Uh, if, it, if it is obstructed or infected, then go for immediate intention. So you, you have to take some preventive measures to, to avoid the recurrence of the stones. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, it was indeed an interesting session wherein uh, we got an opportunity to see intra op uh, videos as well, uh, which actually gave us a perspective as to how the stones are removed from the surgical management uh, through surgical management. And I hope every, uh, all the participants did feel the same, uh, same too. Uh, now I would like to request uh, all the participants to ask the questions in the chat box that's provided, and uh, sir will be answering uh, the questions one by one. So there are a few questions that are already posted here, sir. Uh, one is, uh, I think, uh, during pregnancy, if mother suffers from kidney stones, uh, so surgery is risk or not? Yes, will we go forward with the surgery or not? Will it be a risk factor? Uh, so surgery uh, during pregnancy, we have to under almost whatever, whatever the surgery we have to we have to do in only second trimester only. But at the cost of the pregnancy, and you may have the risk of pregnancy loss. Not only the renal surgery, you can have, if you go for any surgery in the pregnancy, you can. Uh, there is a there, there is a chance of there is a little bit chance there is a one to two percent loss of pregnancy loss. But if the best time to do the surgery is only second trimester. That is fourth month to seventh month. Okay. So before before third month, we should not do the surgery because it may it may it, it may affect the abnormalities of the uh, embryo. And after the seven month patient is about to delivery, so we may we may manage the patient for one to two months. We can manage manage the patient with the conservative management. Then after the delivery, we can go for the surgery. So the best time to do the surgery is uh, second trimester, that is fourth month to seventh month. But the there is a one one person one to two percent of pregnancy loss will be there. It may or may not happen. Okay. So uh, I think it's all uh, symptom based, right? Uh, in case if um, if it is really indicated, then probably you would advise to go for it. If not, uh, uh, if, it. yes, sir, yes, sir. If the patient is having a severe colic only, this is the, the we can go for surgery. If if the patient is having a severe colic, we can we can have a stent. We can stent the patient in the second trimester, and we can do the surgery after the delivery. Okay, okay, sir. Thank you. So another question: uh, Can you please explain in which way diabetes increases the risk for nephrolithiasis? So always uh, diabetes will have a papillary necrosis. That means uh, there is a renal papillae will be necrosed in a, uh, in a diabetic patients, and the renal of the papillary necrosis uh, will just like will, will be slough out from the kidney into the renal system. Then they will form crystals and they will form up stones. Uh, so diabetic patients are at risk, but um, relatively, and if they maintain good hydration, because the papillae, uh, if they maintain good hydration, it is less chances to develop. Uh, I, I think there's some biochemical uh, relation, I guess, wherein in diabetic patients, uh, due to insulin resistance, uh, there's some derangement in uh, ammoniogenesis and risk factor for uric acid stones also increases with lower pH. So, uh, uh, Mr. Gunaridi, if you if you were asking specifically these uh, these two are the probable causes we says. So another question is, what are the risk factors for the development of kidney stone? I think it was discussed. Uh, in the seminar itself, and then can we prevent a progressive calculi without surgical intervention, like with diet and lifestyle modification, purely? Uh, and they, then, and it will most and almost seventy to eighty percent of the times there will be some inherited component like renal tuber acidosis. Most of the stone farmers will have a some metabolic abnormality. That is the hypercalciuria, hypercalcemia, hyperuricosuria. They will have some metabolic component that is that is by birth they will they will they will go at that. So it, it is. It can be preventable, but it is up to a uh, up to a some extent only. It may not be in full. It may, by using only by diet and lifestyle modifications, uh, we can't uh, prevent hundred percent. Up to some extent, we can prevent it because uh, if the baby, even one month babies will have stones. Okay. Yes. Another question. Uh, I mean, like it's related to the say, uh, earlier question, wherein. Uh, what what will be the remedy if the if it is compulsory to go for surgery in a pregnant patient who is around seven to eight months uh, 
pregnant. If it is compulsory, you should you should go for the stenting only. Okay. Otherwise, if it is seven to eight uh, eight months, then under if it is unbearable pain, that the only concern in the pregnancy is and the pain. If it is unbearable pain, you can go for the uh, stenting. Then we can go after the after the delivery, we can plan for the uh, stone removal. Otherwise, generally, if the, if the seven to eight months, generally we don't touch. Under we will manage with the other. We will manage with some pain less. If still, uh, if still patient uh, not really would have colic pain, uh, then under pregnancy loss risk we will go for the surgery. Okay, sir. Uh, uh, one questions one one question from Saitesh. Uh, are di diuretics given in renal cattle for less than ten mm stones? What sir? What sir? Do you get me? Diuretic. The usage of diuretic uh, medications. Hmm. If the size is below one centimeter, is it advisable uh, conservatively to go for uh, conservative for conservative management? Uh, do you advise to go for diuretic uh, management, diuretic drug management? If the stone size is below one centimeter, so there is no relation under. Uh, there is no relation between the surgical management and the stone size. Only diabetic patients will get. Uh, high chance of uh, stone farm. Means the stone farmed. Will Will you advise to go for diuretic therapy, diuretic medical management, diuretics? Yes. So whether the whether the patient is diabetic or not, the diuretic therapy or the medical expulsion therapy will be will be will be somewhat useful only up to the stones of size eight mm. Okay. Because the ureter size only five mm. Mm. So we can we can expect some eight mm stones can pass out, but ten uh, mm stones, whether it is patient is diabetic or not, most of the times patient has to go for surgery. Okay, and I think it's also painful uh, at the time of uh, spontaneous clearance, right? Yes. <laughs> okay. So then, what are the complications if the stent is not removed after two two weeks? So actually, the more the stent can be uh, <clears throat> as long as. If the if the duration of the stent uh, increase in, uh, in, uh, the duration of the stent increase, there will be formation of the crystals around the stent also. So that after that after the uh, around three to four months, if if you want to remove the st uh, stent, stent may not come. So uh, ideal time to remove the st stent is fifteen days only. But we we can we can extend up to three months also. But uh, if it is more than three months, it is not recommended. And sometimes, if, if it is recommended, if we and uh, not in case of kidney stones, but even some, sometimes some metastasis, uh, some RCC or any any pelvic malignancy causing the dilation of the ureters, then you will also stent. Then we will use the long dura stents. That means the stent can be placed for the uh, six months to one year also. Only thing is the st crustaceans will form on the encrustations will form out the stent and then. If the duration increases, we can we cannot remove the stent. So for the regular regular polyurethane stents, the ideal time is 15 days. And if it, if you want to extend, go for three months. That's enough. If after the three months, if the if the incrustation is formed, you can't remove. Then we have to go for same URSL and PCNL for the uh, to remove of the stent only. Okay. Just to remove the stent, we have to we have to break we have to fragment all the incrustations over the stent up to the kidney. So you will do URSL plus PCNL. For that case, so generally we won't advise uh, more than three months for the polyurethane. Regularly use the DJ stents, but if it is silicon stents or metallic stents, for uh, you can use it for six months to one year. But the, usually the the stents are that type of stents are not used for the kidney stones. They will be used for the long term kidney drain. That means patient require the malignancy basis. Okay, sir. Uh, Amarala asks if the serum creatinine level is greater than eight uh, eight mg per deciliter, can can it be reversed to normal level? Uh, I mean, like if it is hmm. if it is if it is due to obstructive of the so rising yes. of the serum creatinine level, maybe due to normal uh, normal decrease yes. functioning of the kidneys, or maybe it is obstructive of the. If it is obstructive of the because of the stones or any obstruction, if you if you relieve that in in short time, but if it is a, if it is a chronic obstruction also. There will be nephron loss. Then it will be uh, difficult for the uh, decrease the creatinine levels. But in case of acute obstruction, a patient may have a creatinine levels up to ten also. Then even for the stenting, even if you may not remove the stone, just you do the stent, creatinine level come down to the normal. That that is used for acute obstruction. Chronic obstructions, you will have a nephron loss. Even you will remove the obstruction also. You will have a somewhat improvement in the uh, some improvement in the creatinine levels, but it may not come to the normal. Okay. Uh, Deepak Singh asks, "What is DJ stent?" 
Uh, it is double J stem made of polyurethane. It is actually <coughs> one the, the, after doing the we are doing see it is all a, it's, a, it's all about technology. Uh, before before advent of the endovirology, we are doing the we are doing by open <coughs> openly we are removed now. Right, we are doing only endoscopic where we will fragment the stone and will come out. After the fragmentation of the stone, the mucosa around the ureter may damage. So then in the healing process, it may develop the stitcher. And in the healing process, it may the it may the peristalsis of the peristalsis of the ureter may not be good, so that uh, uh, kidney drainage may be low. So the DJ stent will help in increase the drainage of the kidney, so that the postoperatively the patient will not get the complications. It is only to heal and drainage, a good drainage of the kidney. Okay, it is a foreign body made of polyurethane. Okay, sir. thank you. Uh, I mean, like a uh, few people are asking about the recurrence again. I think these people joined in late. Uh, I discuss it, uh, okay. Almost by the 10 years, 50 percent of the patients will get again the stones because they have the metabolic abnormality most of the times. So even by good uh, dietary and modifier lifestyle modifications, also by the by the 10 10 years, 50 percent may get the recurrence stones again. Okay. So one question is uh, immediate post op. What are the findings, or what are the uh, what are the things that the patient may face, which he might find odd, but are very much normal after the procedure, like burning maturation for a few days or so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The only major thing is uh, based on surgery, they, they will develop the complications. But most of the times, patient will be develop the stent symptoms. That is okay. burning maturation, increased frequency of the maturation, hematuria, fever, vomiting sensation. They, uh, <clears throat> most of the patients will develop these symptoms only. And uh, around 100 patients, around 15 to 20 percent, you know, uh, obviously they will develop. But after the stent removal, they will be completely relieved. Okay. So just uh, during that stenting time, that of around two weeks, they will have some some of the some of the uh, these symptoms. Somebody will develop the burning and increase pain. Somebody will develop the fever and vomiting. Somebody will develop the burning. Okay. So Nani asks uh, if the patient is not willing to go for surgery. Uh, a hypertensive patient aged one, then what are the other alternatives uh, to get rid of the stone? If it is really obstructive, and the, the main thing uh, to remove the what, what is the need for the removal? So it is obstructive, it will cause obstructive uropathy, then increase the renal parameters, patient may go to the renal failure. If it is really obstructive, whatever the age, whatever the whatever the condition, patient has to go for the surgery. But if <clears throat> if it's really uh, because of all the high blood pressure and uh, diabetes, it is not a contraindication. But really, if it is some ejection fraction is low, some some cardiac abnormalities, if, if the patient is unable to go for the surgery, the best thing to do is stenting under local. But it may or may not be possible every time. Stenting. It means you relieve the obstruction first. So okay. other, if, if you don't relieve the obstruction, you uh, definitely there will be patient will go into the real failure. Okay, sir. So, uh, one question is <laughs> why kidney stones are in different colors? So, that is uh, different the composition. Simply, simply it is a, a, there is calcium stones will some look like a brown color, uh, uric acid stones will look like white color, simply things, cysteine stones, fairly white color. So, this is simply composition of the stone. Okay. So, again, uh, multiple times this question is asked. Yes. Again, can you can you just uh, recap in short the criteria to go for the surgery? Uh, simple thing: <clears throat> ureteric stones less than eight mm. There is a chance of spontaneous passage. More than eight mm, if it is obstructing with some infection or uh, increased renal parameter, we have to go for the surgery. And in the kidney stones, renal stones, which is non-obstructive, more than to, more than ten mm, we have to go for the surgery because they are, they they may not pass. If it is obstructive, we have to go for the surgery. Anyway, there is obstruction, we have to go for the surgery. If it is non-obstructive, renal stones, <coughs> greater than 10 mm, we can we, we should go for the surgery. And your option is yours. So surgery is yours. And the choice is yours whether you go for the PCNL, we go for the RIRs, there are different surgery. If you go for the ESWL, there, there is a different methods, but you are, if it is more than 10 mm, you have to go for the surgery in the kidney. In the ureter, it is only in the 8 mm. More than 8 mm. Uh, and if it is obstructive, you have to go for surgery. Most of the times, more than eight mm stones will be obstructive. Okay, I generally uh, hear this term from you as to whether it's uh, whether it's possible to uh, clear that stone in one sitting or in multiple sittings or something like that. 
Yes, so sir. can you just expand on that aspect as to why it is required to go for uh, multi-stage uh, procedure? Yes, sir. Only the only thing is in case of the PCNL, uh, the multiple sittings usually you usually did for the PCNL, RIRS, and URSL. Uh, so if you go for the PCNL, we will we are puncturing the kidney through one calyx, and patient can have a multiple stones in multiple calyces. We can't get a we can we can't puncture the every calyx. And if you if <clears throat> if you have a rigid scope, it may not enter into the, all the scope, all the all the calyces. Even sometimes flexible scope also. This is a technology. Actually, this is, this is a it is a restriction with the technology. So even if you use the flexible scope also, the flexible scope cannot enter into the all the calyces of the kidney. So if 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 we can enter if 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 we enter into the calyces only, we can remove it. So okay. if it is multiple stones and more than forty fifty mm, uh, it is not possible for the first time. In case of the URSL, maybe if 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 you want to do the URSL, we have to go through the scope into the ureter. Sometimes there will be narrow ureters. Even we can't enter into the ureter. Then we will we will just shunt it and we will go for the second surgery after fifteen days so that the ureter will dilate and we will go for the second surgery. So different reasons for the URSL, you can have a narrow ureters. Uh, sometimes while doing the URSL, you can get the pus. So while while if it is a severe obstructive. uh it, it may develop the pelvic calcium the pus may be developed in the pcs then if if uh, while doing the ursl if you have a pus then just we have to stand we should not remove the stone because it, we are already and all endocrinological procedures we are doing in a closed system so chances of sepsis will be more if we do and we are going with a positive pressure so 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 depends in the ursl if you narrow it or pus you will do a second time in pcnl if it is multiple stones and larger size Uh, it, it may not be accessed through the one puncture. Then we can do the second sitting. In case of the RIRS size of the stone matters because we have to dust it to the up to the two mm, one mm size. We have to dust it. So for uh, around fifteen mm stone, we have to if you want to dust, it will take around two hours. So if it more than two hours, we are we are working in a closed system. Chance of urinary sepsis will be more. So just just the size and location matters simply. If the size is more, chance of chance getting into second uh, second surgery. Mm. Uh, Kutsi asks, "What are the chances of developing urinary sepsis during or after the surgical procedure?" I think uh, you partially answered that question in earlier. Uh, uh, it is simply uh, if we if we if we if we go through the all if we go through all measures that is the low low positive pressures and if we do uh, carefully the chances of urinary sepsis practically uh, it is low very low practically but uh, if the severely obstructed system uh, then. <clears throat> first time the, even if we, even if the severely obstructed system also if if we suspect something infected system then we will we won't do any surgery we will just relieve the obstruction there by stenting or pcn tube then we will go for the surgery then chance of urosepsis will will come down okay sir that's why sterile urine culture before the surgery is must okay Uh, so adiabatic uh, uh, coverage is given before the procedure will that suffice or uh, we should go with uh, uh, the most of and if it is a more direct dilatation of the kidney uh, that indicates that obstruction is from the long time then we will go around 2 to 3 days before only we will we will suggest uh, antibiotics then we will go for surgery sometimes if dilatation is less then we will we can directly we just by preoperative one day we can we will do uh, heavy antibiotics and then we can go for surgery Okay, sir. So, we are asked, what are the chances of kidney failure if both the kidneys have multiple stones? And just because of the stones, you won't get developed renal failure. If it is obstructive, simple thing. It is if it is obstructive. One of the stone can obstruction, then you you have chance of renal. Just by the stones, you won't get the uh, renal failure. Okay. Thank you very much for uh, answering all these questions patiently, sir. Okay. Uh, I think we have reached uh, one hour mark. by now i really thank you for your patience and the way you have explained every doubt uh, the viewers have asked uh, thank you very much sir thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah, thank probably you. next time we'll uh, uh, we'll go with some other topic <laughs> and, yes. and uh, hopefully we'll uh, meet again sir thank, thank you. you thank you and uh, i request all the participants to submit their feedback to the link that's given in the chat box because that will make it easier for us to send the participation certificates to your mails uh we will be sending uh, certificates of participation for people who have registered for this webinar and submitted their feedbacks and uh, is there anything if, if there is anything that you want to convey uh, you can convey through the feedback uh, feedback form itself or you can post your message here
and I'll be uh, ready to answer those queries. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you.